about uh, this particular talk, and you know, it's called "Why is Public Opinion Unresponsive to Renewable Energy?" And there was a part of there was this part of me that's first thinking about you know, there's there's a sense of disempowerment that I get on some. There's this dual feeling that I have with with society in general. One is one of disempowerment, where people talk about, "Oh my word, there's etols again," and the corruption and the traffic lights aren't working and there's load shedding, but there's no action at all. And then there's another element of it, of very um, aware you know, citizenry where service delivery, for example, you, if you do not give me lights and, and if you do not give me water, I will protest. And there's this divide and it's exactly what Tisneen was saying was firstly, we've, we're living with these silos of struggles. And we're also living with a class division of struggles, and that's problematic. Um, but having said that, I do think that there is, a cons there is a problem with renewable energy in that, as individuals, it is expensive to, put, to solarize your house. Let's be honest. Um, so it's not accessible for ordinary citizens. But what we need to look at is change that system and change that the manner in which it's being rolled out. So for me to understand the reluctance to embrace renewable energy, we need to understand the context of this industry. Um, the push, as Tasneem has mentioned, uh, for renewable energy came out of the struggle for climate justice and climate change. But for a long time, and all climate activists have to be honest about this, it was about climate change at a scientific level, very, very far removed from people on the ground. When people on the ground were the ones who were experiencing the direct impacts of climate change, there wasn't that linkage wasn't there, and that's part of the problem. In terms of the vast majority, you know, I just want to add this: is that climate scientists now agree, after heaven knows how long, that to stop catastrophic global warming, we have to keep at least 80% of our fossil fuels in the ground. That's a lot, and we cannot keep mining. Just to let you know, South Africa plans like. 24 new mines in the Waterberg region alone, and coal mining. You know, the common education and circular of information that you get from fossil fuel industry and from this government is that fossil fuels is cheap and we need it for development. This narrative has been the hegemonic belief of the South African um, and global society because it has been backed by the politically and financially powerful industries whom have interest in fossil fuels. And that is, the, that is, for me, the first blockage of renewable energy in this country, is the power of the fossil fuel industry. And Tasneem has covered on the mineral energy complex, so I'm not going to go into that. But over the past decade, fossil fuel industries have been lobbying to protect their interests by emphasizing their narrative, which is the use of fossil fuels. In fact, there was a comment by one of the CEOs, I think it was Exaro, that said that it's fossil fuels that will actually help Africa to develop. And actually, if you look at it, it has caused our misery. A very recent example of this kind of lobbying is the reason, I don't know if people followed this, but it was in the Sunday Times. And the Department of Energy, the minister gave her budget speech last week, and then they had a departmental party. I have to say this, slowly. They had a party that was funded by independent power producers. They drank bottles of champagne that cost 1,550 rand each. When she was asked about this, she said, her response was that the whole event shows the whole industry is united in support of the government. And she said, I cannot tell the private sector I'm not interested. Now you have the renewable energy sector fighting against that. Now let me just say, the news report was independent power producers Independent power producers produce renewable energy as well as coal, as well as oil, gas. So there's different. It's just anyone outside of ESCOM. So it could have been in that circle of friends you had renewable energy people. But what I'm saying here is that if we don't change the way we're doing business, if we don't change the system, then what we're going to do is replace the present economic system of having very rich, having poor, having devastation, with coal and replacing it with renewable. And that is where we're going to make a mistake. We need to be very cautious about how we roll out renewable energy. So, so this 
then brings me into the second blockage, which I think is in, of importance and we cannot run away from it, is that because government is so close to the mining sector, so close to people in the fossil fuel industry, that the policies there of renewable energy then influence it. So for example, the South African government will have you believe that they are 100% behind renewable energy, that they really support it. That's the way we're going to go. They have a renewable energy policy, and it talks about 10,000 gigawatt hours, and I think Richard can correct me if it still stands. They talk about the IRP, and that shows that 42% of renewable energy and 38% of coal and nuclear will be achieved by 2030. What they don't say is the actual amount of renewable energy that will be supplied is 8%. And we still be dominated by coal and nuclear. And every time I say nuclear, I want to fall off my chair. I was an anti-nuclear activist, and I can tell you, we cannot afford it. And if a country comes to you and say, we will back it, as the Russians are doing, and it's called a, a bull uh, model, which is build, operate, own, you need to ask why. With something so dangerous, a country, and so expensive, that a country would want to do that. People need to rise up to that. Also, in terms of climate change, South Africa believes it has more progressive position than many other countries in international climate negotiations. They made big announcements. They talk about greenhouse gas emissions reductions and targets. But recently, in fact this year, the recent exemptions by the Department of Environmental Affairs of SASL, um, ESCOM, and other major polluters say that they say one thing, but then they're doing something totally different. So how do you work this? Some of the other policies that have affected renewable energy, and I think having someone from the renewable energy sector is important because the initial plan was to have something called refit, which would allow you to feed into the grid. ESCOM's claim was that our grid is not strong enough to feed into the grid, but it is being fed into the grid, so I don't understand that argument. They then had this whole thing where you had to bid. To bid to have a renewable energy project, you needed at least a million rand in the bank as a guarantee to put your bid in. So it excludes, it becomes very, very, very exclusive in the way they're rolling out renewable energy, where everybody should be able to just put this out. Just to say, in terms of that, if you put a solar panel on your house and you don't register it, that's illegal. And then when you do register it, you pay much more. Also, let's not move away from the fact that part of the blockage and part of the reason why we're so stuck on coal is of the subsidies. Fossil fuel companies are benefiting from global, global subsidies. And globally, the subsidies alone account to $5.3 trillion a year. That's equivalent to $10 million a minute every day. This report sounds like crazy figures. It's not, it comes from the IMF, the one body you wouldn't think would say this. So that's where this report's coming from. And in South Africa, added to those subsidies, we have other kinds of subsidies, for example, water. So ESCOM has been given strategic water use title. So they are strategic water user. So they get as much water as they need to keep those power stations running. And it's not true that dry cooling doesn't have water. They use water as well. In fact, ESCOM uses 1.5% of the country's total water consumption. How much <laughs> they pay for that? it's minimal compared to what you would think would need to be paid for in terms of that. So there's those kind of subsidies, there's the, the policies, and then of course there's a lot of the myths. We talk about climate change. The reality is that in this country, because the fossil fuel industry propaganda is so strong, we still have a lot of climate denials, denialists. And part of that is the constant kind of, well, renewable energy cannot meet our baseload demand cannot meet our development. We're mining for development. Um, the cost of renewable energy is too high. And these things are constantly being disproven all the time, that we don't need any of that. So the arguments then are falling away, and the one that they're holding on to now is development and job creation, when we know that that's what government does every time they need to do those things. You have those two big kind of blockages for me in terms of renewable energy, and then you you have a citizenry where you think, okay, but why aren't we all just going out and debating these issues and putting it? I think with load shedding, people have been debating it. 
What's concerning is that people would, could easier buy diesel generators than put solar power on their houses. <coughs> and that's the tr as long as government has these controls on that industry, that industry has no subsidies, as you would see with coal. It blocks access for ordinary people. And also to say that it's the renewable energy industry is not like we mustn't look at them with rosy tinted glasses. We must always be vigilant. And good examples of this is in Kenya. When they wanted to build um, wind turbines, they just moved thousands of people off their land. We cannot have that. It's not right. When you had the solar water heater geysers roll out in South Africa, that is an absolute mess. Government should, should account for that. And it's just allowed to happen with a lot of corruption. I mean, you've got solar water heater geysers facing <laughs> south and east and west in the same community. And you think, who did this? And they, there's no one to, so it creates this system that solar water heater geysers don't work because it's badly managed. So we need to be honest about that as well. The other issue for me is that for, for bringing it to people and why are people not doing it? I think also climate change, the depression person, climate change is just such a big problem. How do you, You've got so much and then you've got this climate change thing hanging over you. Renewable energy is too expensive and not ex ex accessible. And when people have no lights for four hours, it's as if the world has ended. And so when ESCOM says we're buying nuclear, no one wants to hear anything else because they don't want to lose their electricity for four hours. And that's the kind of society we're dealing with. But having said that, with climate change, it might seem like a big problem, but there's a lot of good happening on the ground. There are organizations here doing amazing things about renewable energy. Narisha is here, she must talk about her project. But the, 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 the key thing for us is that if we don't make those right choices now, then we are doomed. If we allow government to build more coal-fired power stations and to build this nuclear power station, which by the way, if you saw on Sunday, is now not one power station at Tastebent. It's three power stations and more later. If we allow that, we block out everything that we can get with renewable energy, because then I think we'll have more electricity than we'll ever need. Why government's not listening even to the Planning Commission, I don't know. So in terms of cost, you know, if we build renewable energy at much bigger scale than just one house, all of that, we've been finding that the cost of electricity, and if you look at what's been happening, the disaster with Madupi and Kusile, the cost of solar has been coming, has been dropping consistently. The, the solar voltaic uh, tariffs decreased by 68% and wind dropped by 42%. In fact, wind is now 56 cents per kilowatt hour compared to what you would get at Madupi. In fact, and, and then the jobs mantra, I think we'll cover that in question time. But we always talk about good examples and, one, and everyone talks about Germany. And then when you tell, and you tell people in South Africa about Germany, well, that's a developed country. They had all the infrastructure, blah, blah, blah. I want to talk about Bangladesh. Bangladesh is a poor, densely populated country with about 162 million people. In 2002, only about 30% of them had access to electricity, which loomed as a major constraint to economic growth and quality of life. And for this reason, the government of Bangladesh established a goal of providing electricity to its entire population by 2020. The program that they had in place basically said they will not achieve that. It would take 35 years to get there. And what they've done is they've moved to renewable energy. And in a short space of time, as of June 2009, more than 600,000 new consumers have been connected to the grid for the first time. And access to electricity increased from about 30% in 2002 to about 40%. At the same time, 320,000 co consumers had new solar home systems, surpassing the original target of 50,000. So in the past 10 years, the number of solar systems in Bangladesh Desh has jumped from 25,000 to 2.8 million. That in turn has created some 114,000 jobs. Now this is a real example. This is Bangladesh. Why can't we do it? And I think while we need a vocal citizenry, we need to move away from our silos in terms of our struggles and bring it together because it's about society. Government has a role to play this and they keep making the wrong decision 
we need to be louder about our objection to their wrong decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And thank you for um, raising the example of the developing nation that's um, embraced renewable energy. I mean, I think that's very important for us to hear here in South Africa.